And I'll uh, turn over the podium to, uh, to, uh, to John Thompson, uh, CEO and, I'm, I'm forgetting the formal title, CEO and director of, of NORC? Close enough. Close enough? I actually have right here. I'll get it right. President and CEO. <laughs> President and, and CEO. Um, and, uh, and so after uh, uh, some presentations on population demographics, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, uh, two speakers uh, talk a little bit about uh, the census itself. So. Um, well, let me, let me thank Scott also for putting this together. Um, prior to uh, joining NORC, I uh, spent 27 years at the Census Bureau, and my last job there was I was the career person in charge of the 2000 Census, and I had the good fortune of working with um, Ken Pruitt and a lot of other great people in taking the Census. Um, so uh, today, um, there's going to be a lot of discussion about changes, societal changes, um, what's been happening during the 2000s. And a big question, of course, is, well, how is the Census Bureau going to ever count um, population? And fortunately today, we have two people um, who can talk to us about that. Uh, the first, um, and I also need, need to, to note that I also had the good fortune to work with both of these people in uh, 2000. And, and they made just significant contributions. So our first speaker is Nancy Potok. Nancy is the um, Deputy Undersecretary for Economic Affairs at the Department of Commerce. They are the group that has oversight responsibility for um, the Census Bureau. Um, Nancy worked in 2000 as a, the Principal Associate Director for Administration and the CFO at the Census Bureau. Um, she was the chief operating officer of McManus and Monslave Associates before she came back to uh, federal government. Um, our other speaker who's temporarily stepped out is Stan Moore. Stan is one of 12 Census Bureau regional directors. Stan is the regional director um, for Chicago. Um, Stan, uh, and I go way, way back, Stan's always been one to uh, give uh, me a lot of advice when I was at the Census Bureau about the right way to do things. Um, and I think we'll you'll just uh, be delighted to hear about Stan um, and his talk about how the census is going to unfold in Chicago. So, Nancy? Well, good morning, everyone. I know it's a, it's a long haul sitting here listening to speaker after speaker, so I'm going to give you a little chance to exercise before I launch into my presentation. If, and I'm, I'm hoping it will give you a lot of exercise, okay? So if you are planning to mail back your census form when it comes to your house in the mail, pump both your arms up. <laughs> yeah, good, okay. I was hoping that I'd get a lot of blood circulating there, so that's great, I'm glad to see it. And I figured with this group I could count on you to mail back your form. Um, as, as John mentioned, um, I work at the Department of Commerce, and um, <clears throat> where I sit at, at Commerce um, is the area that provides oversight um, to the entire Census Bureau and also the Bureau of Economic Analysis. So we get very involved in the state of the economy, the economic indicators, as well as looking at the economic and the demographic data that come out of the Census Bureau. Um, my focus um, has been lately, as you might imagine, quite heavily focused on the 2010 Census. Um, and part of that is because I did work at the Census Bureau during Census 2000 with John and with Stan. So I left government, came back, and what I want to do today is um, just give you a relatively quick overview of the, the scope and the framework of the 2010 census and how various pieces of it fit together. I'm not going to talk about the data um, itself. Uh, I think there's plenty of researchers here who can talk about that and, and what it means. I'm really going to be talking sort of operationally and structurally what it looks like. And then I would like to turn it over to Stan, who can tell you very specifically um, what that means for the Chicago area. So my scope is a little national, um, but I'm, and I'm going to go through it kind of quickly because I think the interesting part of this 
at least from my biased viewpoint, is not listening to me, but having the interaction with the question. So I'm going to move through and see if we can't get to some of the, what I would call the interesting part. Um, it is a little hard to see these slides in here. I apologize for that. Hopefully you can see it in the handout. This is kind of a roadmap of the operation. So um, it, it's meant to illustrate that doing the census is a long step-by-step -step process. It doesn't just happen overnight. I'm not going to go through each piece of this in this slide, um, but I will talk about some of the key things that were happening in um, 2010 recently and in the near future um, and not really spend a lot of time on what happened during the last nine years related to 2010. So here we are in February. Um, key things that happen are advance letters get mailed out to people to let them know that their questionnaire is coming. Um, there are special operations that begin and those are in urban and rural areas where it's not um, likely that people would have a good postal address where, the, where they can get a questionnaire in the mail. So right from the get-go, an enumerator will go out there and either leave the form or take the interview right when they go out there. Um, probably most notably where you've seen that, if you paid attention to some of the press clips, was in remote Alaska where the first enumeration took place in a native Alaskan village where um, Bob Groves, the director of the Census Bureau, appeared in a dog sled and, and did the first enumeration. And interestingly, of course, that person was not interested in protecting their confidentiality. Um, they gave a lot of interviews and were happy to be identified as a respondent. Um, but everybody else's answers, of course, and, and responses were um, completely confidential. So um, that's update enumerate. Um, for most people, they will get their questionnaire in the mail, then they'll get a reminder postcard, and then um, census day kind of happens in the middle of that. Um, so there's a, a, lot of, um, a lot of publicity around census day, but really on framing that on both sides, there's a lot of activity. Um, there's also a group quarters enumeration. The group quarters are where um, people are living in nursing homes, um, it's the prisons, it's uh, colleges, dormitories. Um, so that is also taking place in April and May. What will happen um, at the beginning of April is there's a, a mailing of replacement forms, a second mailing. Now the replacement forms, although it's a blanket mailing, it's really targeted to areas that in Census 2000 had a response rate for mailing back their forms of less than 59%. So it's, it's tracks that were identified from 2000 will get a second mailing, not everyone in the country. And then um, there's another targeted um, mailing and that's really to places that are linguistically isolated. Um, primarily Spanish-speaking areas will also get a targeted mailing. Um, probably about 15 million of those will go out. And um, that will take place in April. And then if you haven't mailed back your form by May 1st, that's when the enumerators go out door to door and then um, they'll work through July 10th and then the Census Bureau will start processing and tabulating all that information so the numbers can go to the President by uh, December 31st and then complete the delivery of the information to the states for redistricting by March 2011. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about different um, pieces of this. Um, increasing the mail response rate um, is, is a really big, big goal of the Census Bureau because um, it, it saves a lot of money. I mean, it's, it's sort of the basic thing. If people mail back their forms, then you don't have to spend a couple of billion dollars sending people around door to door to try to find people who haven't responded. So the advance letters, the reminder cards, and the replacement forms are all geared to increasing that mail back response rate. Um, for the first time this year, the Census Bureau is sending out a bilingual form in Spanish and English. There'll be um, 
and also advanced letters in Spanish and English. So um, there's about 11 and a half million bilingual forms or advanced letters that will be sent out. Um, the postcard reminders are not bilingual um, and the replacement forms are not bilingual. They're, they're all in English. But there are a lot of things available in several languages besides Spanish too. And on this next slide, um, also a little bit tough to read. Um, I just want to talk you through some of the language outreach that the Census Bureau has done. So the census forms themselves are in six different languages. They're in English, they're in Chinese, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Um, and that covers about 97.8% of adults um, who speak at home either in their native tongue or in English and their native tongue. So 97.8% are covered by those six languages. But I think, as you know, that's not good enough for the Census Bureau, and it's not good enough for people who are concerned about the undercount. So the promotional materials are in 28 different languages, and um, they're all listed up there on the pyramid. Hopefully you can read it in your handouts, but it's, um, there's just a variety, and that covers 99.4%. Um, so those are TV ads, radio ads, print ads, um, information that people can get on the website. Then, um, again, just to boost that even more, to, get, to cover 99.7% of the population, there are language assistance guides in 59 different languages that are available either on the website or if you call a telephone number, um, you can request one get sent to you in language. The language assistance guides are really copies of the questionnaire in language, and I'll show you a sample of that. And then um, there's a very large partnership staff that the Census Bureau has that works out of the local offices, and they speak um, about 101 different languages. And the partnership specialists are really from the local communities. I'm not going to talk a lot about that because um, Stan is probably one of the foremost uh, creative thinkers and innovators in the partnership area in the country, and I, I know he has a lot to say about that, and I'm sure you want to hear about it in the Chicago area, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, this next slide really just emphasizes what I just said, the advanced letters in six languages, Spanish, English, bilingual forms, 59 languages on the website, and the telephone questionnaire assistance um, offered in six languages. This is a copy of um, a bilingual census form, the Spanish-English form. That's what it looks like. So you see it's got the English and the Spanish side by side for the questions. Um, if, and that's a form that you can mail back in in Spanish. Here's a, a Somali language assistance guide. So it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's the, it's the questionnaire in Somali. Um, the difference being, and this is a really key point, you can't download the language assistance guide and fill it out and mail it back, you're supposed to put it next to the English questionnaire and fill that out and mail it back. So you should be mailing back the questionnaire in English even if you use an assistance guide to figure out what the questions mean. So because the Census Bureau really doesn't have the capability, it would be very, very expensive to try to process all of those forms in, in different languages. Um, but that's why there's a lot of outreach set up, um, questionnaire assistance centers where people can get in-language help right in their neighborhoods. So um, the Census Bureau knows that outreach is really critical and you won't reach everybody um, through paid advertising or through radio spots, through newspaper ads, and um, that it really has to be kind of a multifaceted effort that includes a lot of personal appearances and face-to-face -face contact in some communities. So um, the Census Bureau put together tracked action plans. They looked at tracks from 2000 and scored them as hard to count. Um, they actually scored them in a, on a variety of factors that sort of range from a score of zero up to 132. 
that indicated increasing operational difficulty of doing the enumeration in those census tracts. And um, it, there are things that are really, um, aside from a mailback response rate, there are other characteristics of tracts that you can look at that are very good indicators of um, what you might expect in terms of a mailback rate. Um, the first one being vacancies, of course. If you have a lot of vacancies, you're not going to get a lot, any, there's nobody there to mail back the form. Um, but aside from that, um, there are other characteristics that, that um, have been identified over the course of doing many censuses that are indicators. Um, you know, if somebody's recently moved, if it's a linguistically isolated area, um, the education level, the employment rate, um, the income levels, whether the homes have phones or not, um, renters versus owners, um, looking at overcrowding in, um, in individual housing units, those are all really good indicators. So the Census Bureau um, in the local offices, using the local partnership specialists, put together plans for how are we going to go track by track, what's the best multifaceted plan for reaching folks who live in these areas. How do we get to them? How do we find the trusted advisors in the community? What are their issues? Is it distrust of government? Is it, um, you know, that they're not able to read the forms? Whatever the problems are, track by track, the Census Bureau has been identifying so that they can go out and really address those specific um, issues in in a track-by-track -track way because I think even though the census is national, I think we all know it's local. I mean, in its implementation, it's, it's very local and it's not one size fits all by any means. Um, and I think Sam will talk a little bit more about some of those um, hard to count tracks in the Chicago area and some of the things that, that he's done to really reach out to the local areas. Another big challenge is um, counting people who are experiencing homelessness. And we've seen a big increase in that in some um, rather um, not, the usual, not the usual population, I think, based on a lot of economic factors. Um, and Stan can talk a little bit about that specifically in Chicago, but we see a lot more people because they've lost their jobs are um, living in recreational vehicles, in their cars, in shelters. Um, they may be staying with relatives. Um, all kinds of different living situations that, because of all the um, foreclosures, really, and people who've lost their houses. So um, one of the things that the Census Bureau does is a shelter-based enumeration um, where they count people at homeless shelters and at soup kitchens and at places where um, they're likely to be receiving services because it's a good place to find them. Um, and there are other, other um, tactics. So I think when we get to the question and answer period, if there are things, you know, that specifically related to that in the Chicago area that you want to ask about, um, we can talk about those. Another, um, Another type of enumeration is the group quarters, which is done a lot differently than individual households. This includes military barracks, college dorms, nursing homes, and correctional facilities. And I suppose if you've been reading the paper, you've probably been following a lot of the controversy that has come up about where prisoners are counted. Um, that has, is a, it's an interesting, issue. It's not one that the Census Bureau looks at from a political standpoint. In other words, the distribution of political power, the Census Bureau is not really interested in that at all. The Census Bureau is interested in how do you accurately count people. Um, however, this year for the first time, and I think this is what has um, generated a lot of these conversations, um, which are taking place at the state level primarily, um, the Census Bureau is releasing information earlier than it otherwise would have that separates out the count of incarcerated people uh, in the areas where they are so that the states can determine for themselves whether when they do the redistricting how they want to allot those folks. So it's, it's, it is a change for the Census Bureau um, because there was a, a lot of interest in getting those data. 
Um, the Census Bureau has it, so they're releasing it. But I, I do have to state pretty emphatically that from the standpoint of right and wrong, the Census Bureau has no position whatsoever on that and is really just looks at how do we get the most accurate count um, and what are the issues if, if, for example, Congress were to pass a law that said, well, we want the Census Bureau to count prisoners at their last known address, how would you actually do that accurately? So these are implementation problems versus you know, what are the politics of, of the issues. But I know a lot of the discussion is out there in the press and it's a hot issue in several states. Um, so I'm sure you're hearing about it. Um, so in one of the things, again, that, that the Census Bureau has done is they call it the Integrated Communications Campaign. So there's an element of census in the schools, which are um, materials developed for K through 12. Um, part, it has a twofold purpose. One purpose is really to increase civic engagement among students to really try to make them aware. Um, I think on, on that side, um, it, it has different, um, different effects. I know in many high schools around the country, people have, the students have gotten very engaged, particularly students who are interested in leadership, um, future leaders of America, and a lot of um, inner city high schools um, really have, have gotten involved in that. And I know um, Stan has done a huge amount with the schools in Chicago that he'll tell you about. Um, another is digital outreach, and um, in addition to the regular English language website, um, the Census Bureau recreated the website entirely in Spanish, so that's available. It's, a, it's an exact duplicate. Um, and then there's also Twitter, Facebook, all the social media, YouTube videos, so Census is trying to reach out to people in multiple ways. and. Um, Census Bureau director had started a blog, so, you know, trying to keep up with things, even though there's, um, you know, that one little gap of not being able to res actually respond on the Internet. You can learn all about the census on the Internet. Um, there's earned media PR, which is a, a road tour of vans that are traveling around the country that are interactive and participatory. And then um, there's the partnership activities that I was talking about that are individuals who actually work in the community, and then um, the paid advertising, um, which has three phases. The first is to raise awareness, and I hope, regardless of whether you loved it or hated it, all the publicity on the Super Bowl ad that the Census Bureau did certainly raised awareness, and that was the intent of it, um, as is the rest of the uh, starting um, Pretty much this week, the, the advertising will shift gears and move from awareness to motivation. So you'll, if you've been seeing Census Bureau commercials on TV, you'll start to see different ones that are geared towards getting people to mail back their forms rather than just being aware of the census. So um, there are different messages for different audiences. If you go and look at the website, you'll see there's a number of um, videos up there of people telling their own story about the census from a variety of backgrounds and ethnicities um, so that hopefully when people go to the website they'll see somebody they can identify with who is um, engaged and supportive of the census and encouraging people um, to fill out their forms and, and talking about why it's an important thing to do for their families and their communities. Um, another thing that the Census Bureau is doing is tracking this in real time. Um, there's a Gallup poll that takes place daily, and the Census Bureau had 10 questions added to the Gallup poll. Um, the questions are along the lines of, have you heard or seen anything about the census recently um, within the last week or so? How likely are you to participate and mail back your form? Um, you know, sort of agree and disagree statements in terms of it's important for everyone to be counted in the census. Um, I just don't see that it matters if I personally fill out the census or not. The Census Bureau promise of confidentiality can be trusted in a, a series of questions like that that, that um, we look at every day, and they're broken down um, 
by demographic groups. So, um, and the purpose for doing that is so that you can um, you can really see um, how how to target the outreach. So, if certain groups are lagging in terms of their awareness or their willingness, then you can. Um, the, the advertising program and the outreach program is flexible enough to try to reach out and, and put more effort into those areas where people are lagging. Um, there's also a response rate feedback program um, with the complete count committees. And I hope at least one person in this room is on a complete count committee. Yeah, if you're on a complete count committee, raise your hand. Okay, great. And then um, what will happen is when um, the forms start getting mailed back, you'll be able to go to the website and look at a map of how is your area doing um, in the country. You can drill down. Here's um, a, a mock-up of Cook County. So you can see, um, you'll be able to see by census tract what the mailback rate is on a daily basis. Um, and, and that helps the local communities, too, because if you can see your area is lagging, then you can coordinate your activities with the Census Bureau to really work on those tracks. You can compare it with other tracks. So if you have a little competition going, um, you, can, you can see who's, who's ahead in the mailback rate. So these um, will start going up in late March, and it's the participation rate. So it's the number of completed forms divided by the number sent, but we're minusing out the ones that are undeliverable because there's so many vacancies in some areas, you can really skew the rate badly. If you have a high vacancy rate, it looks like it's a low participation rate, even if 100% of the people mail back their forms. Um, so while everyone is really um, very highly engaged in 2010, um, the 2020 planning is beginning. Um, there's a lot of issues for 2020 that are evolving out of 2010. Um, cost and public participation being right at the top of the list. I mean, the cost of the census is, is expanding tremendously. So um, there's a lot of research that's going to be going on looking at more use of administrative records, how you reach hard to count populations, use of technology. Um, how to keep the address list updated, and then some of the um, political issues that are bound to come up, like where to count prisoners and, and should you ask the citizenship question on the census, which is bound to come up again as well. So um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Stan to really drill down and talk to you about um, sp some specific things that are going on in the Chicago area. Thanks. And Nancy did such a good job, I didn't think I needed to come up. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank everybody for inviting us over here uh, to tell you about the census. Uh, I, I want to tell you a little bit about me first. Uh, I'm the, uh, I like to say that I am the youngest, but the oldest serving census employee in the country. Uh, uh, and, and, and this time I hope to get it right. I've been at the Census Bureau for 53 years. Uh, I've served uh, and worked in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Suitland, Maryland, and uh, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, uh, Mexico, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Russia, uh, and uh, China, and and so I've had a lot of experience in trying to count people, uh, <laughs> and I could tell you some interesting stories. <laughs> uh, but I want to tell you about Chicago because I've been here for a long time and responsible for the census in Chicago. You know, one of the things I learned a long time ago is that uh, uh, you, you heard the saying that the devil is in the details. 
Well, uh, I think the problems and the details. And so I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about that. Nancy and John wanted me to talk a little bit about how we are uh, working in the community and how we get the community involved. You know, there was some time ago there was a, a study called the Valentine Study. Anybody familiar with the Valentine Study that happened uh, uh, through the Census Bureau? Oh, well, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I look at the census, ex-census employees, and, <laughs> and I know they are familiar with that. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And when I first came on, there was a study that uh, showed where we used to uh, uh, test people, and the person that made the high score on the test would get all of the jobs, and we would put them uh, wherever they wanted to work. Uh, but one of the things we did, we moved the family into uh, uh, public housing and, and moved them in there for several months. And they got to know everybody in there. And so we, we did this test where uh, uh, the highest test score would go in an interview at that household and knock on the door, and they would get the information. And they would come away with the information. And we thought that we were doing a great job. And the, the, the data analysis that you heard up here was from those type of statistics. But what we did uh, after we hired that staff, we uh, uh, went to the Valentine uh, people and asked them about who lived in the household. And we found that uh, we didn't get everybody in that household. You know, we got some people. Uh, we were missing. Uh, husbands, children. Uh, uh, so the, the Census Bureau changed their uh, procedure in testing and hiring people. And one of the things that we did, we hire indigenous people. We hire now at the local level, the people who live in the block or live in that track. We uh, test for that block and that track, and we hire people from that area. And we found out that we were uh, knocking on the door, and uh, uh, some of the languages were from people of the, that spoke that language, or, or, or some of the, uh, uh, the people from that community, they weren't afraid to work in that community because they lived in that community. And so we found that we changed a lot of uh, the information that we got. Uh, and so based on that, I'm in charge of the state of Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Uh, and the people most likely that's interested in making sure that we get a good count because the funding, the formulas that are designed and the cities that, are, that come up, uh, I don't know if... A lot of you have seen the special census. I'm in charge of all of those uh, uh, signs that you see for Naperville, uh, Allerton, and uh, Tenley, and the, the count, the population count there with the mayor's name on it. Well, we certify those uh, figures. And there's a lot of competition in the cities making sure that they get a good count. Uh, and, and so I created this program called Complete Count Committees. And I was glad to see that there were some people in here on the Complete Count Committees. I have 6,433 mayors, governors, uh, county presidents that are uh, receiving funds from the federal government through the state or the county. So I went to each one of those mayors, those governors, uh, and I asked them to form what I call a complete count committee. A complete count committee, we recommended seven subcommittees. And those subcommittees could be a subcommittee of, of faith-based groups, 
uh, the business groups, the community group, education. Um, and some time ago, I learned that I was the regional director of the Census Bureau, and uh, uh, Nancy and John and them told me that I was an important person out here. So I called together all the ministers that the Census Bureau was holding a, a meeting to educate you on the importance of the census and why you should spend money in your community to uh, uh, and, and talk about it in the church. And I think maybe 10 people showed up. And Mayor Daly, the, uh, this mayor's father, he called the meeting. And the news media showed up, and the room was full of people. <laughs> All these ministers. And I said, that something is wrong with this picture. If, if he could fill up the room to get all of them in there, and all of them were really interested in what he said. So the, we got the media in, we got all the ministers in, and even on the Indian reservations, uh, uh, they uh, did the same thing. So we found that if we asked the mayor to form a complete count committee, he put in his money. Uh, he uh, elected chair people of the subcommittees, and the community organizations, community organizations that had block grant money. He even got them to participate. So we felt that uh, we would get the mayor. Uh, from for each city to set up a complete count committee. And they're up, I'm, I want to tell you, they're up, they're running, they're doing all kind of things. So if you in your neighborhood would uh, see on public television uh, things that come out from the mayor, if you see on your gas bill or your electric uh, bill, uh, you see parades. Uh, my wife called me one day and said, to come home early, uh, that there was a community at Evergreen Park was having a parade, uh, 4th of July, and everybody was taking their chairs outside to see the parade. Uh, and so I, I did get home, and we were sitting down uh, watching the parade, and uh, a float a big census float came by with all the kids uh, in the back of the float uh, talking about, uh, hey, that, it's in our hands. Uh, and so the neighbors said, oh, you got a census float out there. I said, I didn't know anything about it. It was a complete count committee of Evergreen Park. And, and, the, and the Mayor Daly, uh, who is cooperating a lot with us now. His complete count committee is uh, the, the, the many things that they're talking about doing. Uh, there, there's a program called Be Counted and Questionnaire Assistance Center where if you felt that you weren't counted, he's having a bus uh, or see a sign going up back. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, a bus. Uh, where you can get on that bus and uh, uh, get you get a questionnaire and get some help, and he's going from community to community. He's doing a lot of other things, but uh, uh, I want to tell you about a couple of other things before they they shut me down. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, one of the other things that we're doing, uh, Nancy talked about the hard to count. Well. Based on the American Community Survey and uh, the uh, current population survey and the f uh, 30 or 40 surveys that we do at the Census Bureau, I know in the community where we're going to have a hard time uh, getting people to turn to put those forms back to to mail those forms back to us. And based on the 2000 census. We know that there are areas that's not going to mail those forms back. So we've gone deep into the community. 
uh, and identify tracks that we know that we're going to have problems. And we circle those tracks, and we call them our hot track areas. And we have partnership specialists working in the, what we call community hot track areas. And we have asked the largest uh, church or community organization, we give them all type of statistics of who lives in that track, uh, what the educational level is, uh, why we think that they are not cooperating. And it, it's not necessarily the poorest people or, or sometimes the uh, 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 minority community. Sometimes it's right down Michigan Avenue in these high-rise buildings. You know, uh, we have a hard time sometimes getting into some of those buildings. And I have gone to the buildings to tell the, the doorman that it's a, a penalty that he can't keep our staff out of the building. Uh, and he wanted to know how much the fine was. And when I told him, he said, my tip is larger than that. <laughs> So we have an educational thing to do to get into some of these buildings. One other thing that I want to tell you, I've, uh, and I don't know if you, you, you've seen this, uh, the, that we are also in those tracks in all the public schools. And we have asked all of the uh, football players with rings to come back and work for us. And we call that our sports collaborative program. And so we have here, uh, this is a sample of some of them. Some of these guys made a lot of money. You know, they are wealthy. They're very popular. They are working in the schools and they're forming complete count committees in the school. Uh, this weekend, there's one school that has brought in 7,000 students uh, with this uh, sports collaborative to talk about the importance of the census to carry that information home. And even though a lot of these guys haven't played for a while, the lines uh, of people coming to get their autographs around the corner. Uh, and so it's working, and I hope that Chicago, as well as the, the other cities in my region, will do a good job for you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Dan. We now have time for some questions. But first, I do have to note, um, I had a little opportunity to go out and visit um, the regional office in Chicago or the regional census center that's been set up and visit Stan and I walked into a room and there's a couple of football players in the room so they, they were in there actually working with Stan and um, it was very impressive. So um, questions? Hello, uh, thank you for, to uh, Nancy and Stan for giving us that operational update. Uh, I've had the great pleasure of working with Stan on many censuses and uh, look forward to this one as well. well one of the questions I have is, uh, from the city's perspective, is uh, there's been a lot of questions about when the actual dead, drop dead date is for turning in a form or being counted. So when is that date? So when can someone either go to an LCO or fill out their form? And when is that last date? Because it helps us understand in terms of planning and, and outreach activity. Well, first I would say, obviously, the sooner the better. What um, One of the key things that the Census Bureau would like to avoid is having to go to people's houses. So in order not to get on the list that's assigned out to enumerators of these are houses that you have to visit, you pretty much should have that form in by April 22nd because the Census Bureau has to at that point start cutting the list. Now that, you know, that just starts the next phase then. Starting May 1st, 
the enumerators will be going door to door. So if someone hasn't filled out a form and mailed it in by April 22nd, they're still going to get a visit. But, boy, it sure is a l really expensive to do that. So if you are working with people and encouraging them to actually mail in the form rather than waiting for someone to come to the house, be sure to get it in by April 22nd. Um, now, you can mail in forms after that, but the problem is that then, um, you know, those lists for people to go out and visit are already made up. So people could come and fill out a form and then have someone knock on the door and then they won't want to talk to the enumerator because they'll say, well, I've already filled out a form, but it's not in the record system yet. And so the enumerator is going to insist on doing the interview. And um, we, we'd we like to avoid that, I think, if possible. So if you are working with people and you want, you're encouraging them to mail in the forms, April 22nd is a really good date to keep in your head so that the Census Bureau has it by then. Yeah. Oh, right. oh, I'm sorry. I mean, I guess for me, like, how is it being articulated? I mean, when you spoke about um, having trouble getting into a Michigan Avenue office, but how is it being articulated? What's the gains and losses for being counted and not being counted, regardless if I upper middle class to poverty? Like, what is the gains and losses? For me, if I lived on Michigan Avenue, I don't care to be counted. So what are my gains and losses? Well, I, I hope is that you do care to be counted, uh, <laughs> but but <laughs> but uh, you 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 know every person that's counted uh, helps bring money back to the community. Uh, it it helps to bring the schools, uh, improve the schools, the transportation. Uh, uh, it it helps the city uh, with uh, financing. The reason the, the person that asked the question before uh, to Nancy is John back there who works with Mayor Daly and uh, uh, he probably could tell you more than I could what would be the gains and losses by not uh, cooperating in the city of Chicago, but we hope that you would because we don't want to lose any more congressional seats. Uh, we don't want to, uh, 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 I heard on the radio this morning about how many uh, teachers that's going to be uh, uh, laid off. Uh, so every person helps. In, in the city, if you count it. I, I hope I answered your question. I don't know. I guess for me, what I'm looking for, you know, I mean, I, I sit here and I understand it, but for someone who is not a part of this climate, not a part of this culture, who's just an everyday person, I really need for it to be articulated in a way that I can really understand. It's like when you watch your dollar grow, like can you show, outline, for me being counted, what the totality of that equals? Well, it's tough to get estimates on this because um, a lot of federal and, and, and state pass-throughs are based on population formulas. And this isn't going to be a great answer to your question. I mean, we you know, need to be a little bit creative. But I, we looked at a report. It was about, what, $1,200 per person was the estimate, Chad? Is that something like that over a 10-year period? Um, I don't know. The city has different estimates um, as to, as to how, how big it is. But it's a big chunk of money for every person we don't count because so much of, of federal uh, – uh, so many federal grants and programs are based on population. Um, it also affects your representation and your voice, right? And so if you want to be heard, literally want to be heard, it matters to be counted. Now, you know, that, that might not resonate with everybody, and that's why the programs that Stan is organizing, the complete count committees, are so important because they're able to, to, to get the word out in the community in a way that might be really well received. And actually, I had a question. is If you're interested in becoming part of a complete count committee, where should we go? Where, where should we go with that? Well, if you if you uh, the I have a telephone that you can call the city, and and some of the people, the chair people, sitting right back there. John, you want to answer that? 
How can they join your complete count committees? <laughs> I think the idea is, though, is that there are, there are telephone numbers into the Census Bureau's regional office, so they'll, if you call in there, they'll get you to the right complete count committee. Right, um, and if you're in the community complete count committee, we will direct you uh, to the chairperson of that community, or if you're in the city, we will direct you to uh, the mayor's complete count committee. And one other thing, when we come back from break, we're going to have community organizations up here at the... At the, at the table that are going to talk about the work they're doing to reach out and to improve the mail-in rate. And so you'll have some ideas from them as well. Uh, who's, who's, you, you've had your hand, well, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. Thinking about the lack of a long form in 2010, I, I'm wondering about the relationship at the regional level, or maybe it's only at the national level, of the American Community Survey and uh, are there, is there an articulation there? Is there a change in the sampling? Please tell us about that relationship because the data in that is of very great importance. So I, I'm assuming because you asked the question, you have some familiarity with the American Community Survey and um, the way that it's structured with a rolling sample over yes. the decade. So I think what will um, happen, because the census is a snapshot of, of you know, who lived where on April 1st versus you know, something that was a, a, a continuous type of measurement throughout the decade. So if you're, you know, the Census Bureau, when, when the census data come out and the sort of equivalent American Community Survey data come out. There really does have to be an explanation of how you crosswalk between those because one really is just showing that April 1st snapshot and the other one, um, they're not going to be identical, certainly. So I think the Census Bureau is preparing for that and doing a lot of work in um, getting input from, from different groups and people on what are the best ways to um, explain what what you'd see in the differences between something that would come out for the American Community Survey. And I think particularly in um, smaller areas, you'll see more of a difference because you've got these rolling averages versus a snapshot of one day. So, um, you know, you, I wouldn't expect them to be the same at all. So it's just understanding what you're seeing and what the differences are in them. I, I guess the question behind that question is where are we going to get small area housing data and other kinds of data that we used to get in the long form and now we're only getting samples which are valid in larger areas. How do we get that kind of data? Where's it going to come from? Well, I think um, ultimately it'll come from the Census Bureau. I, I, well, no, I think the, what's, what's happening is the American Community Survey is coming out in waves. So. I think right now you're seeing a three-year average, which goes down to areas of 20,000. Am I right on that? Yeah. And then in, 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 um, in 2010, you're going to see the results of the five-year averages, which go down to the track level equivalent to the um, census long form. So that data will start coming out in 2010. I think, is it still December for the release date? I think so, but I can yeah. double check that. But I just, I just want to add, and I think it was behind the question too, that an accurate 2010 count is crucial for ensuring an accurate ACS in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, because it establishes the sampling frame for the ACS, for the population estimates. It drives a whole series of Census Bureau surveys that, uh, that we're going to rely on for a long, long time. Uh, well, real quick to that gentleman's point about the the money, I think the figure that you quoted, the figure that we've heard um, in the Count Me In Census Initiative is 1,200 a year per person and federal funds alone. Um, but I think we'll talk about a little bit more about that on the next panel. But my question was specifically a challenge that we've been facing, particularly in the Auburn, Gresham, Inglewood, those kind of areas on the south side, is that a lot of the mailboxes have been removed. Yeah. Um, and we've been trying to figure out from different entities from the mayor's office, I don't know if you all have any answers around temporary mailboxes or any kind of 
um, strategy to address that challenge, particularly on the south side. You, you mean that the, the post office is taking up their mail mailbox? Right, that mailboxes have been removed. Like if you go down 79th Street, it's a mile before you see a mailbox. Right. Uh, we we haven't been told that uh, w where those mailboxes have been uh, uh, removed, but we're talking to the post office now about temporary mailboxes uh, for the census. Uh, we don't know if we're able to get them out there or not. Uh, when we will go back with the B County forms and the questionnaire assistance centers, uh, I am talking to the post office about putting temporary mailboxes out there. And, and John has asked me, I see his hands up, has asked me who should he talk to in the post office. John, have you had any communication on that? We are trying to get confirmation from the post office as to your question, uh, but we are trying to get all the existing mailboxes mapped. Um, and just to confirm the point about the, the impact of the census in terms of dollars per person, the $1,200 per person per year is what we've been um, putting out there as well. So to answer the question about how does this impact me or anyone else, um, that dollar figure is something we try to, to stress and emphasize with people in terms of what they're worth um, obviously, there was a lot more than that, but in terms of how the census affects them, um, that's the figure we've been using. I know. My question is, is there a way to download the form and email it back? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we will mail the forms to every household. We had a, a operation uh, uh, in 2009 where we identified every address in the United States where we will mail the form. Uh, those rural areas uh, and some places in the city uh, where we know that there are mail problems, we will hire enumerators to take the questionnaire to the door. So, uh, the, and then there's a certain time that we will have be counted stations and questionnaire assistance centers where if you didn't get a questionnaire, you can go the, you can go there and pick up a questionnaire. It just seems so in this day of technology that we would have something so that could that could save costs. Yeah. Yeah. I. I, I I agree with you. I mean, there's a, there's been a lot of questions about why why aren't there more electronic response options? Um, at this point, it's way too late to to put that into the design of the census. I mean, it just can't be done right now um, because the questionnaires are about to be mailed out, and and the Census Bureau right now has no capability for processing anything that might come back via email or filled out sent over the internet. Um, but it, it is a, it's front and center in the planning for 2020. There's a lot of issues in terms of how people respond to questionnaires that they can look at electronically. What are the formats that are gonna be available 20 years from now? Will people do the questionnaire on their iPhone through an iPhone app? I mean, there, you know, things 10 years from now, the technology is gonna be tremendously different. Over the last decade, um, the Census Bureau looked at some technologies but really didn't sort of push that envelope, primarily, I think, because they were worried about IT security issues. Um, but a lot of advances have been made in, in IT security as well. So I, it's hard for me to envision any kind of 2020 census that really doesn't rely heavily on electronic options, um, whatever the, the handheld technology is or the computer technology and I'm I'm working um, diligently right now on the 2020 planning so if that means anything you know probably when you f do your form in 2020 you can do it electronically but not this time let's, let's do her and then he's had his hand up for just forever <laughs> 
Um, well, thank you both for um, this really enlightening panel. I am just uh, someone who's very interested in population studies and issues. And I was wondering if you could give me your perspective on um, something. It seems like the census, um, there is a balance that you need to strike between um, protecting the, the respondents' confidentiality, you know, to ensure participation, and on the back end um, to provide a, an um, accurate, um, picture for researchers, uh, an accurate data set for researchers to use. And recently, um, you know, I read um, someplace about kind of frustrations that some researchers have voiced about, um, you know, in protecting the confidentiality of the respondents, sometimes um, within one respondent's answers, um, things are switched, you know, a, a female might be switched to a male and whatever. So in the, on the aggregate, the, the, the summary data is still the same, but when you're running things like um, correlations or regressions, then that kind of messes with things a bit. And um, you know, I don't really um, know much more about the subject, and I was wondering if you could speak to it. Thank you. Um, how you avoid disclosure of confidential information is probably the topic of a whole conference in and of itself. So I'm not going to give you a very thorough answer um, right here. There's, there's a lot of people who are experts in um, disclosure avoidance and the types of things that you have to do. Um, there's many different approaches and opinions about how you can do this. But I, I, you know, I have to acknowledge there's, all, there's been for a long time, particularly you know, as the use of computing power has increased and more and more records are available through open sources. Um, I don't think that tension between um, trying to protect the confidenti confidentiality of data but keeping the data integrity intact for researchers, um, that's a tension that's going to continue to exist for a long time. It's, a, it's a, an interactive relationship with interests on both sides and it's an evolving area in terms of how you can best do that and serve everybody's needs. But it's not an easy topic. There's no simple answer to it. Um, thanks. Uh, just a quick follow-up to the, the issue of the, uh, the missing uh, post boxes. And uh, when these forms come, um, they come with a return envelope. And is that envelope postage paid? Yes. And can they can they bring it? Can they drop it in instead of actually mailing it in? Can they drop it at one of these regional or these local centers that are staffed by the census? Can they drop it off instead of mailing it? Yeah. Even if it was mailed to them, we'll take it. <laughs> yes, we'll take it and put it in the mailbox. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, I'm told that, that we have to uh, end it. Were there, the, the stand, stand and answer be around all day so you can ask them questions. So thank you very much to the speakers.